Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, apologies for uh, the delay in beginning class. Uh, I hope online students, you can hear me. Okay, thank you, Shubham. Um, so apologies for beginning late. We had some technical glitch here. Uh, uh, so they're trying to fix it. Um, so if you have any questions today, online students, uh, you will not be able to unmute your mics and speak. Uh, please type it out in the chat and I will answer your questions. Um, um, because, you know, uh, I can't hear you. And uh, hence, we'll have to accommodate ourselves with what is available. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, we'll begin class today. Um, thank you all for uh, joining class. Welcome to our in-person students as well. Uh, welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture um, later on. Uh, this morning, we'll start and begin our study of um, this um, uh, publication. I don't know if you can see that. It's blurred on your screen. OK, it's uh, receiving God's guidance. Um, we'll be following this publication from now, from today onwards. Um, just before we begin, I like to mention that you know most of what is uh, given in this publication is kind of repetitive of what we studied in fulfilling God's purpose for your life. And because I went into a quite an in-depth study in fulfilling God's purpose for your life, uh, there'll be quite a repetitions that are mentioned here. So I will not be going through every content that is here because we have to finish this book and another book as well. Uh, so since we have done quite an in-depth study on fulfilling God's purpose, whatever has already been taught there, I will kind of just briefly mention and move on. Uh, so please don't feel that I'm skipping out on content. It's because it's already been um, you know, taught in uh, the previous lectures on our first publication that we studied. Okay, is that fine? Yes. But if you still have any doubts when you go back home and read and you have any doubts, please feel free to ask and I will uh, explain again. Okay. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, God, that uh, in spite of all the uh, glitches that we could still have uh, begin our class today. We just want to pray for um, uh, the power that's not there, that you would bring back the power, God, and we'll restore every um, uh, system that is here and everything will work perfectly. And God, even as we uh, look at uh, how we can receive guidance from you, we pray that you would, God, open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth, not just receive it, God, but also to implement it in our lives, that we will not just be hearers of your word, but doers and we will experience you in a in a greater and a powerful way we thank you we pray that you remove every spirit of dullness lethargy sleepiness and boredom we pray god that you would open our hearts and our minds and our spirit man to receive what you are speaking to us we thank you for hearing our prayer in jesus name we pray amen so god is our guide do we need god's guidance in various matters of our life yes uh, only in big matters or even in small things? Yes, yeah, small things, right? If somebody says something to you, you don't know what to answer. Like when we have mentoring hour, we really don't know what to answer students when they have questions. There's a lot of prayer that is being, sh you know, God, what do I say? What do I, uh, Holy Spirit, help me what to answer? You know, you're in, you're in the workplace, uh, you know, you're a teacher, your students are asking you questions, you're a mother, you're a parent, your children are asking you questions, you have to make uh, decisions, small decisions in life, big decisions in life, um, you know, um, every decision in life uh, that is made, uh, you know, we need God's guidance, okay? And we have this wonderful privilege of um, having God as our guide and the ability to receive his guidance every step of the way, okay? So the Bible does not give us a formula uh, for God's guidance. There's no fixed formula in the Bible. Uh, but yes, the Bible does tell us that God guides us and that he answers us. And so we're going to look at 11 different ways in which the, you know, uh, which the Bible uh, guides us into God's guidance in our um, lives. So if you look at the introduction, there are 11 different ways. So can somebody please read that, please? Circumstances, 
Divine orchestrations, yes. Um, just give me a couple of minutes. I'll um, just... Okay, I don't know why it's not, um, I'm not able to post this attachment for all of you. I'm trying to post the receiving God's guidance, but it's not, uh, sorry. No, uh, if without the Wi-Fi, I cannot, uh, you know, have this class, right? It's all on Wi-Fi. So I don't know why it's not attaching. It's not giving me the option to post. Sorry, it's not giving me the option to post it for all of you. So maybe I'll try during the break time. Uh, there is some issues that we are having, but yeah. Uh, Abhinas? Yeah, so uh, our, uh, um, our staff here in Bible College will post that uh, in the stream page because I'm not able to do that. I don't know why it's not uh, uh, allowing me. Mm. Yeah, you can't hear the people in the class, uh, Shani, because I, like I said, we're having some power issues here and uh, there's some glitches, but thank God at least you can hear me. And if you have any uh, queries, you can post it on the uh, uh, in the chat section and that way, you know, at least we can have our class. Thank God for that. Um, yes. I'm trying to share the book with you, and if I have to share the book with you, I have to post it. So I'm uploading it, it's uploading, but it's not posting, it's not giving me the option. So like I said, I've asked our um, staff at Bible College to help us, okay? And it will just be posted in a couple of minutes, so sorry for the inconvenience, and thank you for your patience. Okay, so we'll continue. Uh, so we look at... Um, 11 ways we can, uh, you know, different ways in the Bible that God releases his guidance in our uh, lives, okay? Now, we know that God is genuinely interested in the decisions that we make in our lives. Did you know that? Sometimes we think God does not care, you know, uh, what decisions we make, but he's genuinely interested in the decisions that he has, that we make, and he has promised to give us guidance. So if you look at uh, chapter 1, uh, can somebody please read uh, Psalms chapter 37, verses 23 to 24, please? The steps of good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. Oh, sorry. Uh, you can't, uh, you can't, uh, they can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Psalms chapter 37, verses 23 and 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. Now, the, it says that the steps of a good man, it's basically talking about a courageous man, a valiant man, you know, is ordered, which means is made perfect is made firm, it's set up, is directed. So God makes your steps firm. He makes your steps perfect. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Okay? And the Lord takes pleasure in the way that you are 
going. God is very interested. He takes pleasure in the way that you are going. Look at what the Amplified Bible states. The Amplified Bible states that, you know, um, God busies himself with every step. Okay, God busies himself with every step. That means God, every step that you take, God is also very, very interested. He's very busy with the, the steps that you are taking. So God is very interested in our lives. He's interested in the steps we take. He's interested in the path we choose and in the decisions that we make. Now, since you were not able to listen to the 11 um, um, ways that, you know, uh, uh, God gives us guidance in our lives. I'll just like to uh, read it out because you were not able to listen to the in-person student as they read it. It's the word, the indwelling spirit, the voice of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit, dreams and visions, prophecies, angels, godly counsel, the renewed mind, times and seasons, circumstances, and divine orchestration. Okay, so this is what was read by an in-person student, and you could not uh, hear him out, okay? So this is how God leads us. We've already looked at it quite in detail in the first publication. We look at it a little more um, in this publication as well, okay? So... Um, the, God is interested in the path we take, in the decisions that we make, in the life choices that we make. Now, the, the, imagine this great God of this universe who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He's actually very busy with every step that you are taking. That means every step, every choice you are making, he is so interested. Imagine with the millions of people around this world, God is interested in each one of us, you know, whether we are small, significant, insignificant, okay? So even if we make mistakes, even if we stumble, even if we falter, this verse says that it's not the end of everything, right? Because this verse tells us that, you know, though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand, right? So the Lord holds you, grasps you in his hand. He supports you and he upholds you. So you need to have this assurance, hey, that when I go through, as I'm journeying through life, there is this God of this universe who's all powerful. He's holding my hand and I will not slip or I will not fall. I will not falter. Okay. Psalms chapter 32, another verse that we can look at, um, you know, God promising to lead us and guide us is Psalms chapter 32, verses eight to nine. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Yes, else they will not come near you. Okay. So God is saying that, hey, my eyes are on you. Okay. God's eyes are on each one of you and his eyes are watchful eyes. Okay. That means, you know, he's, he's saying, hey, I got my eye on you. Like, you know, uh, when um, mothers when they have small children in ho in their homes, little babies, even if they're cooking, even if they're doing the dishes, even if they're doing something, their eye will be constantly on their daughter. What the daughter is doing, where they're putting their hand, where their leg is, where they're going, their eye is constantly on them. So like that, God's eye is on you. And we know the psalmist says that our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. We don't have to wake him up, right? He neither slumbers nor sleeps. His eye is on you. And he says, I will instruct you and teach you. Amen. Amen. God says, I will instruct you and teach you. So God say, God, teach me, you know, teach you. <laughs> God, teach me how I need to uh, study, how I need to read your word, how I need to live my life. God, instruct me as well, now, if you look at these verses in uh, in the meaning that it has in Hebrew, you know, it brings out a lot more significance. It brings out a lot more meaning. Now, if you look at this phrase, I will instruct you in the Greek, it basically means that God is saying, you know, you will be intelligent, prudent and wise. That means God is saying, hey, I will give you skills for your success. So how many of you want to be successful in life? So here God is promising us, some of you putting two hands up, I like that. You know, if you want to be successful in life, God is promising us that, hey, I will give you the skills. I will give you the skills to make you successful. So pray and say, God, give me the skills to make me 
successful. So God is here to make us intelligent, uh, you know, and prudent and wise. Okay, the new book is posted. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John, for confirming that. And it says that, you know, um, uh, I will teach you, okay? And so it's a very beautiful meaning here, this word teach you. If you look at it in the Hebrew, it has a figurative meaning. That means it says pointing a finger at, okay? So if you're asking someone, hey, which way do I go to APC Bible College? They will say, hey, take this road, turn right or turn left, you know, uh, just go uh, walk down a couple of, um, uh, you know, minutes and then you will find APC Bible College on your right. Okay, so they're pointing the finger and directing you. So here it actually has also a picture of a man shooting an arrow. You know, when a man is shooting an arrow, he wants to get his arrow at the target. Yes, he wants to get his arrow at the target. Okay, so God is saying, hey. I've got the target in my mind. I have the way that you need to go, the plan, what you need to do in this circumstance, and I am pointing my finger to you. I am showing you the finger. Okay, so I have the target in mind, and I'm going to show you all you need to do is just obey and follow the instructions, right? And then he says, uh, you know, it says here, I will guide you. Guide means I will advise you and I will counsel you. So just imagine this great big God of the universe cares so much for us. He's saying that, hey, I got everything, you know, what you need to do in this situation. I've got it in my mind. Just showing you the finger and pointing the direction, showing you what to do, showing you the person you need to go to, showing you how you need to fulfill this or uh, get this thing done. Just obey me. Just follow me. You know, and he's there to advise us and counsel us. So the Lord has promised to guide, instruct, teach, counsel, and, you know, uh, give us the wisdom, the skill, the knowledge, the understanding that we need to go through life. Amen? Yeah? Uh, and so this verse that we read in uh, Psalms chapter 32, verses 8 and 9, it says also verse 9, that, you know, even if God is pointing his finger, showing us, guiding us, instructing us, giving us the skills, there is a response that is required from our end. So God always works in collaboration with us, okay? So we need to co collaborate, we need to co-work with uh, God, right? So he's going to guide us, but he's asking us for a response. It says, don't be like the horse or the mule. So what is he meaning by don't be like the horse or the mule? Means don't run ahead of God. You know, in life, don't run ahead of God. Just walk beside God. Say, God, you are holding my hand. I'll take the steps that you're showing me. You know, walk along with God. Don't run ahead of God. Okay, that's when we can... We can mess up. We can make major uh, wrong choices. And also don't be stubborn. Don't hold back. Say, no, God, I'm not going to do this. I don't see the clarity. I don't see the picture. I don't, I don't see why you're telling me to go to this place. I don't see why you're telling me to do this. I don't see why you're telling me to engage in this. Okay? So don't be like the horse or the uh, mule that, you know, runs ahead or that is stubborn and is held back and it's hard to move forward. So we need to avoid this postures, okay? But we must say, God, you know, you are guiding me. I want to work alongside with you. And like you promise me, like you instruct me, like you teach me and guide me, I will follow you. And you can say, God, let's do this too together, okay? We look at another uh, uh, scripture verse, Psalm 25 verse 12. It says, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses, okay? The, the Good News Bible, if you read the same verse in the Good News Bible, it says, those who have reverence for the Lord will learn from him the path they should follow, Okay, so what is it saying here? That those who have walk in reverence, you know, that means what is reverence? That means those who are submitting to God, those who are obedient to God, you know, take his instructions seriously, have their heart in the right place, a right heart attitude and saying, God, I'm willing to submit. 
I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to follow your instruction. That is reverence. So here it says, those who have a reverence for the Lord will learn from him the path they should follow. So you can ask me a question. Hey, you're saying that God is so eager to guide us. He is busy himself with every step that we take. He's very, very passionate and interested about every choice that we make. But I am asking God to lead me and guide me. But I'm not getting any answers. So maybe what is the reason? We are not co-working with him in the sense we are not people who have come to a place of obedience, submission, surrender, and we are not taking his instructions seriously or we don't have the right heart attitude. We're saying, God, I'm in this mess. Get me out of this mess. Okay. It's like, you know, do or do anything. Get me out of this mess. It's like God is saying, hey, I'll get you out of the mess, but I want you to learn something, some character issues that has to be dealt with, some attitudes that has to be uh, dealt with. Okay. So you're saying, God, I'm not interested in that. Just get me out of this mess, then that's not a right heart attitude. That is not having reverence towards God. Okay. So God guides us and leads us and God's promises to lead us and guide us. The other thing we need to also know is the revelation of God's will. Okay. So uh, we've already looked at all of these things in the previous publication. I'll just mention it as we go along. The first one is God's will, guidance, and leading is always consistent with his nature. We already mentioned that, right? I said God will never lead us or direct us to do anything that contradicts his nature or will contradict what he has already spoken in his word, right? So if you want to know what God wants you to do, if this is the right choice, then you need to know, hey, this is not contradicting God's nature then this is what God wants me to do, okay? So God cannot guide us into something that is unholy. So somebody says, hey, God told me to marry this unbeliever, you know? What do you know? What, do you, what can you say? In your mind, you know that that's not God's guidance. It's their own desire because God can never lead us to do anything unholy that is out of his nature and contradicts his word. His word also tells us, right, we cannot be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, right? And um, even when we say, hey, God is telling me to divorce my husband. If there has been a case of, um, you know, adultery, if there has been a sexual uh, abuse or violence, then yes, we can look at it. But if the person comes in for counseling and is willing to change, then you cannot go ahead with divorce. You can't say, hey, I'm divorcing this person or my spouse because I like somebody else or I find somebody else more charming or somebody more exciting or somebody more caring and helpful than my present spouse. No, we can't say that it's God telling us or speaking to us or guiding us. We know that it's not because that is contradicting God's word and it's not his nature. Yes. Okay, that's your friend. Okay, got into a relationship. I'm just... Uh, Telling it so that our online students can hear. Okay. Got into a relationship with an unbeliever. Okay. Okay. The relationship went on for a long time. Okay. She made that unbeliever into a believer. Okay. 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 She made him into a believer. Yeah. yeah but, uh, but after that, they, like, broke up. Okay. They broke up. And, like, Parted ways. Yeah, okay. So, what do you think? Is that God's plan? She's a believer marrying an unbeliever. Is that God's plan for her? No, like, no the Bible really clearly says you cannot be unequally yoked with unbeliever we always think that we can make that unbeliever into a believer but unbelievers many of them unbelievers think all gods are one god right and so whether you worship this person or the other person or anyone else it's they are all one but then he was he he committed you know because he's thinking hey all gods are one god but there is no you know foundational or the basis is not there 
you know, his love for God is not there. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone ahead with a separation and with a divorce. He had an encounter with Jesus. Okay. 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 Okay, fine. Okay, he started praying because he had some depression. Okay. Okay, he had an encounter. Okay, fine. No, I don't think it's uh, God's plan to make him a believer through that relationship. It just happened. Okay, thank God it it uh, he became a believer, but was not God's plan. So God doesn't. That is what we can say sometimes. You know, it's like the permissive will of God. God allowed it so that you know the end result would be good. Sometimes, yes, God uh, can use situations and can turn situations um, around, but it's not that God could not do that otherwise. But what she did was sheer disobedience, okay? But God used it to, you know, to bring that person, uh, yeah, to his saving knowledge. And God uses every opportunity, right? So we can't say that God allowed it, you know. Then we're saying God is contradicting his word in the Bible. And he says you can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You can't. And God does not work and change towards uh, according to situations. No. His nature, his word does not change. Heaven and earth will fade away, but his word will never fade, will never pass away. Okay? Yes. 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 Okay, when he becomes a believer, is renewed. Yeah, okay. Okay, can a believer... Can a, can a believer marry that guy? Can he be, marry a believer? Yes, why not? Yes, okay. Okay, so we'll move on. So God is always, what he does, guides us and leads us, is always consistent with his nature. He will never tell us to do anything that contradicts his nature, okay? And um, uh, God also guides us and leads us and it will always be consistent with his nature word. God will never ask us to do anything that contradicts his word. Okay. So, and the Holy Spirit also teaches and guides us according to what is mentioned in God's word. He will not contradict that uh, as well. Okay. So sometimes, you know, um, in our understanding, um, we can misunderstand or misinterpret the Bible. And that time, you know, God will contradict us with his word. For example, when Jesus was here on this earth, on the Sabbath, he went around healing people on the Sabbath, right? And were people very happy with that? No, people were very, very angry with him because they were saying, hey, you're breaking the Sabbath. Okay, you're breaking the law. Yes. So what does, and even when Jesus was picking up that, you know, his disciples were picking up the uh, grain to eat because they were very, very hungry. You know, the religious leaders were offended and they questioned Jesus. Why do you break the law? Why don't you keep the uh, Sabbath? And we see that Jesus explains and says, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? Sabbath was made for man means it was made to show him or for his convenience to teach him that, hey, there's a need for a day for rest, right? A, need, a day to uh, rejuvenate, to renew, uh, to be refreshed, a day to spend in worship and just communing with God. But also that Sabbath was made for man, but not man for Sabbath. You can't bring in legalistic laws and rituals and traditions which kind of become a discomfort for people. So when people are doing good things on a Sabbath, you know, it doesn't mean that you stop them from doing those good things. You know, so Jesus was saying, hey, you know, it's important to show love, kindness, forgiveness and heal and help people even on a Sabbath, you know, because Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath. So here, these religious leaders were making this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, something that God had instituted. They were uh, interpreting it in their own terms, in their own understanding. And Jesus comes to say, hey, I've come to, you know, 
reveal to you or I've come here to minister or to tell you what is the correct interpretation of that. And that is why he tells them this. Okay. Look at another example. You know, um, Peter is very hungry, right? In, in Acts, uh, I think it's in Acts chapter um, 8, Peter or, uh, or 9. Uh, uh, Peter is very, very hungry and the food is being cooked for him. He goes up on the, on, the, on, the ter on the terrace and he's waiting and then he sees a trance, right? A, a white sheet and uh, God gives him all unclean and shows him all unclean animals and says, get up, Peter, uh, get up and kill so he says, I cannot do that, God, because these are all unclean animals. And the law states that I cannot eat these unclean animals. And what does God tell him? What does the Holy Spirit tell him? What I have made, don't call it as unclean. So we see later on, then God tells, the Holy Spirit tells him, hey, Peter, there are two men waiting for you. Go to this man called Cornelius's house. So he goes to Cornelius's house, who's a Gentile. They have people sitting there. And Peter is preaching the message. And what happens? Before he gives altar call, their people were convicted. They were cut in their heart. And they, were, they already started. Uh, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they were speaking in tongues. And then Peter realized the, uh, the meaning of the trance that he had. Okay, So sometimes God can contradict our misunderstanding, our misinterpretation of the Bible with the correct understanding of what he has said in his word. Are you all able to understand? But God never contradicts his word. Okay, what does it mean by walking in the fear of the Lord? It basically means a reverence. It basically means when we walk in the fear of God, we walk in obedience, we walk in total submission, we walk in total alignment to his will, to his purposes, alignment to what he has asked us to do in his word. Okay, I hope that helps Shani. Okay, okay. so these are two things that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, and the third thing is God promises uh, are a revelation of God's will. You know how many promises are there in God's word? There are more than 3,000 promises in God's word. It's not just for the promises to be in God's word. It's for us to know those promises. There are promises in every area of your life, every situation that you face. There are promises Take those promises and what you need to do is you need to speak those promises over your life. And also God's promises in our lives indicate his will or his plan and purpose for your life. So if you want to know what God's plan and purpose for your life is, what you need to do is, you know, look at, uh, you know, his promises. And those promises will help you to know his will in your lives. Okay. God desires for us to know his will. We already have spoken about that. Okay. And uh, when we seek his will, God reveals it to us. And we studied this in the previous publication. Remember, we studied about Colossians chapter 1 verses 9, 9 to 10. Uh, it says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it did not cease to pray for you and ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I hope you remember I taught this, I think in the first class, in the second class, I showed it on the uh, PowerPoint slide and I explained that again. So what is Paul praying for the believers here? He's praying that they will be filled with the knowledge of his will. Okay, so each one of us can be filled with the knowledge of his will. What is the meaning of being filled? It means being full, okay, not lacking. That means none of us will lack the knowledge of God's will in our life, okay. So as believers, we will not lack, we will not fall short in knowing God's will for our life. So if you want to know God's will for your life, you can pray and say, God, fill me with the knowledge of your will. Okay, the word knowledge in Greek means, you know, to be complete, to be deep, to have a clear knowledge. So you will have a clear, deep knowledge, a complete, full knowledge of God's will. 
Okay, so what Paul was praying here for this church at uh, Col Colossae is that he's praying that they would be filled with the clear, precise, accurate knowledge, understanding of God's will. So you can pray that as well. You can say, God, I want to be filled with the full, precise, accurate, clear knowledge of your will for my life. Okay, so go take a moment and pray that and say, God, fill me with your full, complete, precise, accurate, clear knowledge of your uh, will. Now, this passage also says that, you know, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, like I said before, to know God's will, we need to be filled with wisdom and spiritual understanding. Where do we get wisdom and spiritual understanding? The word of God. The more you read God's word, the more you know his will, the more you will be submissive to doing his will. Okay. So, um, and we know what is the outcome of doing God's will. Uh, we've already looked at it. What is the outcome of doing God's will? We will walk worthy of the Lord. We will be fully pleasing to him. We'll be fruitful in every good work. We will increase in the knowledge of God. But the other side is also true right if we do not know god's will we will dishonor him we will not please him we will not be fruitful and we will be stagnated in our spiritual growth okay another verse that we will look at is ephesians chapter 5 verses 8 to 10 and verse 17 it says verse 8 for you were once darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of the light for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So what is this verse telling us? Do not be unwise. That means do not be senseless. Do, the Greek word for unwise is do not be senseless, do not be foolish, do not be lacking in your intelligence or reflection or don't act irrationally. Don't act without reason. Okay. You need to use your mind to know God's will. Okay. So here it's saying do not be unwise means do not be foolish. Do not be lacking in intelligence. Okay. Do not act irrationally without reason. Okay. And the Greek word for but understand what the will of God is. It means basically put together. Understand means put together. Join the ideas, what God is saying and what you can rationally think in your mind. Bring, you know, those opposing thoughts. Bring those opposing ideas. Process it effectively in your mind. Okay. So here... It is suggesting us that when God reveals his plan and will for our lives, it's important to use our intellect. It's important to use our brains. It's important to use our mind. Sometimes we become so spiritual that we throw our minds out, right? We shouldn't throw our minds. God uses our mental faculties, okay? Uh, so it's important to use our minds and our critical thinking skills to discern his will, okay? So... Uh, like, you know, and sometimes when I'm praying for something, you know, uh, I say, God, what is your will in this area? And I'm not receiving any, uh, you know, download from him. I'm not receiving anything from the word that he's speaking and say, God, why are you not speaking? And then finally, God is getting, you know, tells me, hey, look at what I am showing you, right? You want to know whether you want to associate with this person. I have showed you instances where you have seen clearly that this person is, you know, you will not get along with this person. You cannot collaborate with this person. Uh, this person has no integrity, no honesty. I'm showing you things. Use your brain. Use your mind. Don't keep on saying, God, say yes or no. If you say yes, I'll go. If I say no, I'll stop. God is saying, hey, I'm giving you the case scenarios. I'm showing you things. Look, use your mind. Okay. Recently, I was praying for something, praying, 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 and finally God is saying, I've already showed you so many instances. Look, what do you think? Use your mind. 
They say, yes, God, this is not for me. This is not the right thing for me. Okay. So God, you know, wants us to use our intelligence and our mind. And that is what it says here. Okay. And bring those opposing thoughts, ideas, and process them effectively with your minds. Okay. And also as God reveals things for us, there is, you know, a responsibility that we must uphold. It says here, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. So even as God reveals things to us, it is our responsibility to seek and understand what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, the word acceptable in English can mean, you know, okay, chalta hai, you know, merely okay, average. But here in the Greek, it does not mean God is saying, okay, you want to do it, do it. This is okay for you, you know. It's fine. It's not that. In the Greek, when you look, it has a much richer meaning. It signifies something agreeable, well-pleasing, without any shortcomings. So when God's will for you is acceptable, it means, hey, there is no shortcomings in this. It is well-pleasing to him. It's not something, it's okay, kind of, it'll work, you know. It's fully agreeable. It is no shortcomings and it is well-pleasing pleasing to uh, him okay so it's important that we use our minds and our critical thinking to discern god's will because sometimes you know people overlook things uh, and you know we need to use our na rational mind and think like when i go to north india many times when you go to villages to pray and minister to people many people come with knee issues you know knee problems and i know and they ask me to pray. Okay, so there'll be a whole line of people asking to pray for knee issues, hand issues, elbow, and all of those things. So I know that in North India, people love to eat potatoes, right? And you know, potatoes, what can it do, right? It kind of brings in a lot of uh, aches and pains in our body, especially when we go, reach a certain uh, age level. So I ask them, do you eat a lot of potatoes? And they say yes. And I say, if you stop eating potatoes, your knee issues, your knee problems will come to an end. And they're looking at me puzzled because I know that they want me to actually pray for them. Come on in the name of Jesus, speak healing and all of that. But I'm just using my mind and telling them. And then I don't want to disappoint them. I'll say, no, no, I'm praying for you as well. But I'm telling you something that will give you long-term remedies. So sometimes we also have to use our mind in telling people and they don't like it. Right? When we use our mind and tell them something, they really don't like it. They get upset. They think that we are not spiritual. They think that, you know, we don't want to pray for them. But we, yes, we need to use our minds and also, you know, release the supernatural and pray for healing for their lives. Okay? We'll stop here and then we'll come back after the break. Thank you.